Hello again everybody and welcome back to Fujits Blitz. Now this is a different kind of video. It's still steeped in military stuff, but it's a bit of a move away from Blitz. And we're going to talk about the tragedy that is Poland. Now World War II was truly an horrific conflict. It has been estimated that around 80 million people lost their lives worldwide. A vast majority of which were civilians rather than actual combatants. Numerous films have been made, books, both fiction and non-fiction written, and we all think we know more than the basics. But do we really? Okay, we know Hitler came along and Germany was how bent on dominating Europe. We know the German armed forces steamrolled the French and then turned on its erstwhile ally, Russia. We know the Germans eventually lost overwhelmed by the combined superior forces which we believe were the Russians, the British, the Americans and the French. But is that actually true? Yes, Germany lost the war. And yes, the Russians lost almost 30 million people combating the Germans. So it's fair to think that Germany was the biggest loser and Russia the nation that suffered the most. But that is strictly not the case at all. Ironically, the country that suffered the most, and was in fact the biggest loser of World War II, was not one of the major players that we are bombarded with in the movies and in literature, but the country that effectively turned the initial conflict into an actual world war. Poland. Poland's story is indeed a tragedy, straight out of a Shakespearean play. Poland as a nation came into being around 966 under the Piast dynasty, ruled by Poland's first recognized king, Mizeko I. Uh, excuse my pronunciation, my Polish is pretty bad. However, this new nation state was always destined to be pulled and pushed around by most of every other country around it. With the ascension of Casimir III in 1320, Poland's vision was altered to that of a sovereign nation. They had a reformed and very strong army. Their education was the order of the day, and the discrimination faced by the Jewish population was ended under Casimir. He also brought in the University of Krakow, which was opened in 1364, one of the oldest institutions of education in Europe and the second oldest in the eastern central part of Europe after the Charles University in Prague. Unfortunately, this period of Polish history wasn't to last, and Poland's golden age came to an end during the reign of Sobieski, where the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth faced constant wars and fell into decline, especially when faced with the rising powers of Prussia, Russia and Austria all of whom wanted to have a bit of a bite at poor old Poland and between the 18th and 19th centuries Poland was partitioned this way and that pulled in all directions by the time World War I came around Poland as an independent sovereign state didn't actually exist it was split between the Austro-Hungarian Empire the Russian Empire and the German Empire after the war Poland was reformed and the territory that was previously seen as Prussian, which is most of northern Poland, with the exception of East Prussia and the Free State of Danzig, which is Mongete Gdansk, this was granted to the newly reformed Polish state. And this is where Poland's real troubles began. Poland's great tragedy is firmly rooted with the fact that it had the very worst neighbours anybody could ever wish for. On the one side, they had Nazi Germany, still smarting over losing Prussian land. And on the other side, they had Communist Russia, also pretty miffed with losing what they felt was Russian land. And faced with two regimes that were intent on power at the expense of Poland, Poland's writing was on the wall. That's not to say the Poles didn't have any friends, because they did. Very powerful friends, in the form of Britain and France. But what could these powerful friends do in real terms? In fairness, neither were able to actually get to any Polish territory to offer any meaningful support, leaving Poland wide open to attack. And when that attack came, and come it did, it was both swift and brutal, and from both directions. 
Despite Nazi Germany and Communist Russia being ideologically opposed, they were surprisingly the same, especially when it came to Poland. With the implementation of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, or the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, whichever way you want to talk about it, these dictatorial regimes effectively carved up Poland. The Germans from the West, the Russians from the East, and the Poles didn't stand a chance. Poland's plight didn't end with the dual invasion. In fact, it only got worse. Yeah, the British and the French declared war on Germany, but that was toothless raw in real terms. I mean, once the Nazis got their feet onto the table, the Poles were to end up becoming the nation that suffered more than any other country during World War II. Yes, the Soviet Union suffered extremely heavy casualties. Estimates vary between 20 to 30 million. I mean, these are not small numbers, but that actually accounts for about 12% of the total populace. Poland, by contrast, lost 6 million. That accounts to 17% of the population. Whereas Germany, the you know the evil evil guy of World War II, only lost around 8% of its population. Therefore, in real terms, Poland was the nation that suffered most from World War II. And the thing is, it doesn't even end there. The German occupation of Poland was both ruthless and cruel. I mean, not only were they how bent on turning the entire nation into that of their slaves, but with Poland having one of, if not the largest Jewish populations in Central Europe, they were also how bent on the total destruction of most of the population. Not only that, but the Soviets weren't actually good landlords either, ensuring that during its brief reign from 1939 to 41, they systematically destroyed Poland's intellectual elite, especially in the East, most notably in the form of the Katyn Forest Massacre, where some 23,000 Polish officers were executed by Beria's NKVD. Okay, the Soviets were harsh. I'm not going to say they were friends here, but it's the plight of the Poles under the Nazis that brings a new meaning to suffering. The Nazi Gauleiters, these are regional leaders, ruled like medieval overlords, especially such figures as Otto Greiser, who ruled most of northern Poland, called the Vorteland, Erich Koch and Hans Frank, the ruler of what the Nazis called the General Government. Basically, the General Government was a southern Poland, and it was seen as a general dumping ground by the Nazis. Aside from this, Poland also became the country where the Nazis would build its main and most notorious concentration camps. Auschwitz near the town of Krakow, Treblinka, Sobibor and Bautzek in the far east of Poland, near the border with Ukraine, and Chalmno, the place where the Nazis actually perfected their execution techniques. In fact, if you actually look at a map of the locations of concentration camps, you will find that the vast majority are located in Poland. In fact, despite concentration camps being strongly connected to the plight of the European Jews, not only the Jews went there, Auschwitz, initially housed Polish prisoners long before any Jews were sent there, and their suffering is no less than that suffered by others, such as the Gypsies and the Jews. Some Poles, however, were able to join the Polish Free Forces, based in England. They were, they were able, at least, to fight the Germans. Unfortunately, these Poles weren't exactly better off either, sometimes being treated as second-rate units, despite their clear and heroic abilities. The Free Poles fought with distinction at the Battle of Monte Cassino in Italy under General Anders. This was not the case with the treatment under General Sosabowski, however, who, despite his forces being heroic and fighting with distinction, were kindly a second thought during Operation Market Garden. With the tide of the war turning against the Germans, the Poles saw their opportunity, and in 1944 they rose up against their Nazi overlords in Warsaw, the Polish capital. At the same time, the Soviets advanced, but they were then stopped by Stalin. Many believe this was a cynical move by Stalin, effectively allowing the Poles to be destroyed by the Germans and the Germans to be destroyed by the Poles, allowing the Soviets to just like walk in. The Soviets even refused to allow its own allies, the British and the Americans, from airdropping supplies to the Warsaw Ohm army, relenting upon that at the very end, but it was too late by then. Hitler was incensed by the Warsaw Uprising 
and ordered the total destruction of the city, something the Germans kind of managed. The Battle of Warsaw was one of the most brutal during the entire war, and some of the most notorious Nazi units, such as the Dilvanger and Kaminsky Brigades, were given a free range. Even General von den Bakzelowski was shocked, despite being an SS general and one of the architects of the final solution, thus he was no stranger to atrocity himself. Uncharacteristically for Bakzelowski, he not only accepted the surrender of Bor Komorowski's own army, but he also agreed to treat these Poles as pre pre prisoners of war, something Hitler totally disagreed with. Even now in modern day Warsaw, it's very difficult to find any buildings that exist prior to the destruction of Warsaw during the Warsaw Uprising. With the end of the war and the defeat of the Germans, one would think that the Poles' troubles would be over, but alas, no! Yes, the Nazis had gone, but now the Soviets were in, and despite being allied to the British and the French, who went to war after all with Germany over Poland's independence, they were there to stay. I mean, the British didn't exactly shine during this period, with pressure to accept the Soviet occupation being placed upon the Poles, even from the very highest echelons. In fairness, there wasn't much the British could do. Yes, Churchill had been a vocal critic, and he had fought tooth and nail with Stalin over the Polish issue. But what could be done in real terms? I mean, the Soviets were there, and they were there to stay, and they were never going to allow Poland to be independent. Again, Poland found itself being bullied by a bigger neighbour, and there was nothing its so-called powerful friends could do about it. There is evidence that the British even considered turning on the Soviets, but the feasibility study drawn up told its own sorry story, namely that while such a conflict could, in theory, be won, the cost would be absolutely huge. Poland's plight during World War II is by far the most tragic tale of all those caught up in the conflict. The suffering of Poland is unprecedented, and despite having what they believed to be very powerful friends, they discovered that only existed on paper in real terms. One of the more poignant tragedies of Poland is if you go to the site of the Battle of Monte Cassino, which is a Catholic monastery on a massive hill in sort of central Italy, you will discover the Polish cemetery, honouring those who fought and died on that fateful mountain in 1944. You will see that the vast majority of those who died were from the city of Lvov, one of the most eastern and most beautiful of Polish cities, steeped in history. Only nowadays it's called Lviv, and it resides in the Ukraine. This sums up the tragedy of Poland, that even those who fought bravely for their country came from a city that hasn't been Polish for some 76 years. Anyway, I've been Fujit. That has been a brief take on Poland's tragedy. By all means, comment and everything below. And until the next time, guys, I'd like to thank all of you for popping in to view my video. Bye for now. Bo szkoda gadania, bo co chcesz to mów? Nie mam